One summer, my dad told my mima that Jesus was an alien, you know, just to piss her off. It worked. Uh, that same day, she gave me a calculator thinking it was a computer, or as she said, a pooter. God bless those Southern Mimas. The new technology was just as unknown to her as aliens, but not as much as Jesus. There is an unlikely relationship with religion, technology, and UFOs. They're like the power thruple that no one really talks about. No one except my next guest. She is a professor of religious history at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Her research focuses on religion, technology, but it also re is research about purgatory specifically that led her to the UFO culture, a journey she documented in her book, American Cosmic. Today, she's going to help us understand the connection between tech, religion, and little gray men. Catholic ufologist, academic philosopher, investigator of secrets, Dr. Diana Walsh Pasulka. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Meredith. What an introduction. <laughs> so <laughs> your dad was, no, your mom was Jewish. Your dad was Catholic. Mm -hmm. Both were non-religious. Mm -hmm. But you knew at age 11 that you wanted to study religion? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I did, actually. So I had it figured out in the sixth grade that I wanted to basically do the things that priests do in the sense of, I wanted to read the Bible in the original language in which would, it was written at the time. Of course, I had no idea what language that was. I just knew that what I was reading, I'm sure there's, you know, it makes sense, but probably in its original language. And I knew it had been translated. And then I, um, I did, I, that's what I did do that. So, um, and so I guess from an early age, I knew that I was interested in this. My parents, I wouldn't say they were non-religious. I would just say that they were secularized. Uh, so okay. my mother was secularized. Um, and my dad was, he would take me to midnight mass on um, Christmas, you know? And so I would go to, um, I would go to church. Actually, when I was a kid, I made my, my mother take me to church, various churches. And she was cool with it. She was like, okay, I'll do that. And I would say, I want to go to this church now and this church now. And so, um, and I became a Christian. I became a born again Christian. And, um, and then my dad said, why don't you, why don't we put you in a Catholic school? Because, you know, that's our tradition of Christianity. And at that point I didn't understand the different denominations. And so I did, and I was actually quite, um, impacted by the sisters there it was the sisters of mercy and they were uh they lived the life of helping people really you know and um that made a huge impact on me so yeah so that was my childhood in california no less wow that is so interesting you know they do they say that whatever you're interested in as a kid is really a great um, compass to follow for your adult passion. So I, it looks like that worked for you. It did. <laughs> so how did purgatory, studying purgatory, lead you to UFO culture? Sure. That's a great question. Um, people want to know, wait, you study religion and you study the UFO belief system and right. they don't understand. And yeah, the connections are completely weird and I get it totally. Um, so this is how it happened. Now you have to understand that I am not, I, I wasn't a believer at all in UFOs. I thought people who believed in UFOs were a little bit, you know, like, wow, you know, yeah. I, I scoffed and you know, that kind of thing. So this is how it happened. And it happened in late 2011, early 2012. Um, two things happened. First, I had finished this book on purgatory, which is a Catholic doctrine of um, people who it basically it's it's a huge Catholic doctrine that people don't actually practice anymore. So if you talk to Catholics like over 60, they'll remember purgatory and praying for souls in purgatory. But if you anyone younger than that, they're not going to remember this because it the the doctrine, while still a dogma of the church and a doctrine of the church, it kind of went away in the 1960s with this thing called Vatican II, um, which was a council of Jewish, I mean, <laughs> of Catholic bishops. So this is the idea in purgatory. So you have a soul, right? 
and you're not, that soul is not good enough to get to heaven. So it goes to this place and this place is called purgatory and it stays there until it's perfected and, and purged of sins and then it can go to heaven. Um, so this was a huge doctrine all throughout Europe. If you go to Catholic cathedrals, you'll see there were places for people to pray to, to help souls in purgatory. They pray to God and say, help my, you know, my Mima or something, you know, she, I, you know, she had some issues. And, you know, get her she wasn't purgatory. sure about those calculators, you know, she needed help. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, um, all right. So I, I had to go deep into the tradition. So I would go to archives. I'm, um, you know, trained in archival research. Archives are really old libraries, basically, with old books in them and, th and things like that. And so I did this research for a long time. And when I was going through these records, I come across aerial phenomenon and uh, little beams and things like that. And I was, you know, I thought they were so strange. I thought these are strange reports from Catholics in 1400 and 1500 and 1800. And so I kept a log of all of these. I said, well, okay, I'm going to log this because it was a pattern that I noticed that kept repeating. And e these were either interpreted as, well, these have to be souls from purgatory and they, they're lost and we have to pray them back into, you know, purgatory because they don't know what they're doing kind of thing. Or, we don't know what these things are, you know, but they, they might be demons kind of thing. So, you know, there was all these kind of, or they might be angels. So there was the, there was this interpretation that uh, the people of the day would give those aerial phenomena. And um, okay. So I had this big log of things. I, I really didn't know what to make of them. And I included maybe one or two in my book on purgatory. And I, you know, it was in press. It was, going to be published and it was on to the next thing because that's what professors do right they have to go on to the next book and research and so before I did that I gave this log to a friend of mine and I said what do you think of all this stuff and he looked it over we were having coffee and he took some time looking through it he looked really serious and then he said these look like UFOs and and I was like what <laughs> I go, leave my office. Like, you are crazy. <laughs> and um, it just so happened that he said, no, it looks like Steven Spielberg stuff. Like, you know, if you looked at a Steven Spielberg movie, you would see these kinds of things in the sky. And what happened after that, this is how it gets weird, was that there was a, a, a UFO conference in my town that I went to. And I listen to people who are experiencers. These are people who feel like they're, they've either seen UFOs or experienced the, uh, you know, what are called um, close encounters with inhabitants. And, and they all sounded exactly like my research. And I thought, okay, yeah. So this stuff, whatever it is, it looks like it's still happening and I really have to look at it. So I thought it was going to be really easy, actually. I thought that it would be super easy just to go ahead and say, we don't generally do cross-cultural analyses, you know, and say this phenomena is like this phenomena 400 years ago. But I, I thought it was close enough that we could do something like that. So I embarked on doing research and, um, and it took me into the weirdest places that I've ever been. <laughs> I mean, you know, and, um, I w and so, yeah, so uh, I then wrote American Cosmic. I mean, I met now we can say who he is because he's outed himself. But some of the people in my book, this was prior to the government coming out and saying that UFOs are real, right? So that happened in June 2021. My book was released about UFOs in 2019. So my book came out prior to this. So the research I had to do, a lot of it was with people who had to be anonymous. Mm -hmm. So I gave them pseudonyms in my book. And one of those people um, is Dr. Gary Nolan at um, Stanford University. And he was working with me. We worked together on this. And I was basically, I was studying how he, this amazing professor, you know, he has like four labs at Stanford. I mean, he's like a top researcher in the world, believes in this. I was like, okay, this is, and we went to New Mexico and we went to an alleged crash site and things like that. We met Tyler who, is part of the space program, space force and stuff. And he's been like, he's, he's a, uh, he was a mission controller and he did a uh, space shuttle mission control work almost throughout the whole program of the space shuttle when that was going. I mean, um, it was unbelievable to me, frankly, 
So that's that's how it happened. It was unbelievable to me in the book too. Some of the stories that you were telling, I was really expecting your book, by the way, to be kind of highbrow, and I found it a lot more easily read than I anticipated because you're weaving these incredible stories in throughout the discovery of your research and actually the research itself. So, you know, thank you for that. Sure. <laughs> so I found it funny that you said that there happened to be a uh, UFO conference in your town when you were discovering this. And I was like, wait a minute. She wrote about it, that in her book. Isn't that synchronicity when you like could yes. possibly interpret pers events as personal providence? <laughs> Did you interpret yes. it as personal yeah. providence? Okay, so I do have a whole section in my book where I discuss synchronicity because synchronicity, when I started the research, I already have noticed that within religious traditions, synchronicity, if a person is doing a lot of practice like prayer or meditation, if they're Buddhist or, you know, then synchronicities are going to happen to them. And generally, they're going to interpret the synchronicities as they're on the right road, like you did, providence, right? This is, this is, so in a sense, synchronicity is the engine of religious belief because, and it happened with my purgatory book too. I, I interviewed people who were doing work, trying to reestablish purgatory as a doctrine and practice. And they would talk about the synchronicities that they had. And so I already knew to look out for these things. But when I started my UFO research or my research into UFO belief, I mean, it was just happening so much that I said, okay, I have to talk about synchronicity because this is, this is just too, it's, it's happening so regularly. So I've taken a position on that um, because what if, you know, I don't know what it is. So I think that as a professor, I have to basically always have this agnostic position where you can identify that it's working and that it's there, but you don't actually, if you don't know what it is, you don't have to try to have a conclusion about it because I didn't. And, um, what I did was I offered a bunch of different theories, basically Carl Jung's theory of synchronicity and, um, Dave Stinnett, who, um, was like a friend of mine and a researcher during the writing of the book. Um, I thought he had a really great idea of synchronicity. And then Frederick Nietzsche talked, believe it or not, he's a philosopher. He talks about synchronicity. So, and then of course, all these people that had synchronicities, there was even this person um, who had a synchronicity with digital media, you know, where like, so I thought, okay, this is just where it gets really strange because a lot of people have technology synchronicities yeah. and they're not, <laughs> they're not algorithms, you know, they're not algorithmic. Okay. I was going to ask you about that because um, I was thinking like, well, we voluntarily put listening devices in our homes, right? All of the smart speakers. Google yes. is using algorithms to give us newsfeed headlines that support what we already believe. So it's kind of like these things could be digital providence or in, interpreted that way. And, you know, like the internet gods have left me a sign, you know, I must go right. this direction. Yeah. So do you think that's creating a population that potentially believes everything it sees and hears? Or conversely, people are just completely agnostic and like a Pollyanna society, even like in the movie, Don't Look Up. Right. So um, I think that's the, the question we have to ask at this moment in time. And I ask that in my book and I talk a lot about that because um, and I use the work of Jacques Vallée because Jacques Vallée actually, strangely enough, here's another strange synchronicity. Um, he's a person who's well known for being kind of like one of the top people who looks at UFOs. Right. So he's he's French. He lives in Silicon Valley. He's written a lot of books about UFOs. And in, 19, in the 1960s, um, he got a PhD in information technology for Northwestern. And he worked for our military on ARPANET, which was the proto-internet. So he had, and he even talked about synchronicity with video conferencing, which was in the 70s, kind of like a thing, right? Like kind of like what we're doing now. And so... Um, but he had had synchronicities prior to that. And synchronicities was obvious. Synchronicities are obviously pre-digital world, right? right? Right. Okay. So you know what he thought? He was the first one to identify that it's not the algorithms that are creating the synchronicity. 
it because they were existed prior to us being encased in this algorithmic reality. He basically said the the structure of reality is algorithmic. And so our minds will put something out there because he would do research on really strange, random stuff. And then he would get, then things would come to him as like a search engine. He said, it looks like it's a, we are a search engine or we are in a search engine, you know, and our minds put stuff out there. And then if we do research right and identify, you know, and, and we pay attention, then it comes right back. So synchronicity has a long history. In fact, if you go back to the biblical world, like um, who is it? Augustine, you know, one of the church fathers, early church fathers, it was a series of synchronicities that had him convert to Christianity. Interesting. So, yeah, so synchronicities have been, so the question is now synchronicities are being absolutely multiplied because of the actual algorithms that right. listen to us and say, you know, so you talk to your, husband or whatever, or partner, and you say, you know, uh, so-and-so, my 11-year-old wants Captain Crunch or something like that. And then you get like five ads for Captain Crunch you know, right. that come at you. You know, that's not a synchronicity. That's just a stupid algorithm. So but there are, I mean, there are some algorithms that are like, that are fairly sophisticated. And in fact, um, some of the people that I've spoken with are thinking that some, like the UFO phenomena itself is like a sentient algorithm. Like in oh, some ways, wow. like, I know it's really out there. So <laughs> that's a really out there. I became so much more aware of all the theories of um, UFOs. And, and, and I do see how, and now that I've read your book and we've talked and I do see how tech, religion, and UFOs are intertwined, but I think of, upon like first glance, those three things you're like that those aren't related. Maybe tech and UFOs, but the religion part, you know, it just seems it seems unlikely. I I wanted to ask, speaking of theories, your theory about uh, we'll call them interdimensional beings, aliens, etc. I had always hoped deep inside that our future relationship with, we'll call them aliens, would be, uh, would have like a strong sociological benefit where we would, I don't know, advance emotionally and have a depletion of ego. I mean, cue the kumbaya music, right? Um, do you think that when that happens, our earthly benefit will be primarily technological or do you think there will be more of a spiritual side to it as well? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. So I think that um, this is what has been happening. So there's been, you know, I mean, my, my, let me explain how a person who studies religion now studies uh, the belief systems of UFOs. Okay, so in my field, we don't advocate religion, right? We, some of us are religious, some of us are atheists, some of us are agnostic. So we have archaeologists, sociologists, historians, we use many different ways to uh, look at the processes and practices that we call religion. Um, so we're, a, we're an academic field of people who do what's called religious studies. So to take this and, you know, we don't have to say that, that this particular religious truth for these people is actually real, right? We just say, we're going to study the social effects of this for these people and for society. Um, so we take that lens and that framework and we apply it to this rising belief in UFOs here. And so what I was doing in my book was I was taking the rising belief in UFOs as a way, as an example of how technology has created a new form of religion. Because a lot of people, look what you just said. You just said, you would hope that we'd have a sociological benefit, right? That somehow these aliens would help us be better spiritually. Well, that's a that's a religious or spiritual belief right there, okay? And a lot of people believe that. So there are a lot of people who believe that those visitors, right? Whoever, whatever they are, are here to kind of uplift us spiritually as, you know, ethically or better, that kind of thing. Which is why your grandfather would tell Mima. Jesus is an alien. Okay. You know, <laughs> because he came here now. Um, another person who has this, this idea, but maybe not 
so that, you know, it's going to be a better situation, but is Jacques Vallée. And so his idea is that this is like a control system. And he also takes this idea of aliens and he says religions work the same way, right? So they kind of like, they they rely on the presence of non-human intelligent beings. Those are either God or angels or bodhisattvas, you know, you name it, you take the religion. And these non, these uh, non-human intelligent beings are more advanced than us and they give us stories and ways of being and ethical codes and that kind of thing. So it's kind of like controlling human behavior. And so he, of course, being a person who is trained in information science, then says, you see these patterns, it looks like a pattern of control. You know, it looks like this control system type thing. So I guess, um, I don't know. That's my answer. I don't know. <laughs> but I do, I do know that, um, that religions get spun a lot of times by state and governments. And so, um, you know, if you look at, in fact, I'm teaching a class right now about early Christianity and you look at early Christianity and you see that there wasn't a lot, there was nothing written during the time period that Jesus was born that we know of that has to do with Jesus, right? Except for from Romans saying there's this bunch of people that believe in this guy named Jesus. Okay. So, but Jesus that we know of didn't write anything. And we don't have any kind of firsthand knowledge about Jesus. But, you know, 20 years later, Paul writes letters to the churches after Jesus dies, right? He's crucified. And then we have about 200 years later, 250 years later, we have the creation of the Bible and these biblical texts. But believe it or not, there were like, you know, a hundred or more texts that, that weren't included in the Bible that were just as authentic and you know, anchored other Christian belief systems and churches. So then what happened was that the Romans decided that Christianity would be the state religion. So they decided on a certain way of belief, right? So a lot of Christians don't know that either, that, you know, early in the early time period, you know, there were diff- there were as many different forms of Christianity, not as today, because today there are so many, and we have a lot more people, but there were so many back, back then. At, right after Jesus was crucified. So um, now people have their interpretation. Same thing with, the, with aliens. So we have this military idea of what it could be. We have the, the ideas that we've been trained by media to believe, like the little green men or the greys and that type of thing. And then we actually have people who have experiences talking about it. And when you look at the experiences, they actually don't at all look like what the media tells us it looks like at all. So, I mean, you have these different, you know, so how, you know, what, so my, my suggestion then to your audience is, and in fact, I say this in my book is whatever you see on the media about this is not really what people are experiencing. They're not experiencing like independence day type aliens and things like that. You know, I've never thought of different alien theories as like denominations you know, like I've never made that correlation until just right now. That's so fascinating. If there's so many, uh, if the bones of religion and the bones of alien theory and ufology are the same structure, they're the same, made of the same stuff, why are so many people in um, some religious communities, I th- I've only heard Christian communities become upset about alien theory. Why do they get upset if it's like kind of made of the same stuff? Okay, so if you're within a belief system, another belief system might compete with yours, okay? So what I've seen in Christianity specifically, and I see a lot of people who've had experiences of UFOs who are Christian. In I, li- I live in the South, and so it's a very Christian area of the country. And so I've, t- I've heard and talked to so many Christians and it's traumatic when they have a UFO experience. It's traumatic for them. Um, I know one person in particular who had a very, you know, this is a man who was a successful businessman, well-known in his community. He was a deacon at his church. Um, I believe he was Baptist. And he had this experience with some of his employees. Um, he was fishing down at the river. And they all saw 
some pretty incredible things and he had experiences and things like that. And afterwards it, it completely shattered him really. And even his, his community. And, um, at first his community told him that he saw demons, right? And he wasn't really sure that he saw demons. He didn't know what he saw. Right. And so he did a lot of his own research and then, um, he didn't talk about it for a long time. And then finally he was, he said, I'm just going to talk about this because it was real. It really happened. And, um, and then I met him and, um, he said, this is what happened. And I said, yeah, I said that, you know, that sounds about right. Yeah. You know? And he said, and he goes, and I don't think that is incompatible with Christianity. Mm. He said, I think that this is a spiritual thing that happened to me. And he said, so I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. So he asked me questions and I have a friend who's a priest and, you know, and that was born and raised here in, um, in North Carolina. And he asked him a bunch of questions uh, because this, this man who's a priest, he's also a professor of the New Testament. So he knows, he knows the Greek inside and out. So my friend went back and what he did, I call it, it's, a, um, it's something that, um, it's something that I've found to be the case in a lot of instances where a person who's a reli- from a different religious tradition will have a UFO experience and they'll, they'll go back to their own tradition and reinterpret their own tradition to include these kinds of things. So then my friend would go back to the biblical text and say, Jesus coming in the clouds, what does that mean kind of thing? And, you know, this kind of thing. And, you know, and so a lot of them are also very apocalyptic. So that means that they believe that, that the end times are really happening. They're going to happen soon. And, um, yeah, so it gives them an urgency and a sense of um, almost trauma, you know. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty intense thing going on. So a lot of people don't consider it to be bad. They consider it to be a part of their religious tradition. Now, that said, there is a group called Alien Resistance, and this is a Christian group. And basically they say if you begin to become abducted by aliens, call out the name of Jesus and the abduction will stop. OK, so this is, a, you know, this is another group and they they have their own. And there are also there are also people in government who view these as um, they, they're Christian and they view these as the incursions of a, uh, the aliens as incursions of satanic forces. So, you know, you have all kinds of different belief systems within the structures of alien belief. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I am like drawing so many connections as we're talking because uh, like when you said the military folks, you know, um, people within the military, they have their own, I don't even know what to call it, like dogma. Like they have, you know, their whole world and their job, understandably so, is an us them kind of thing where there is Mm -hmm. a threat, we're here to protect. Um, And so they would, I could see where they would see UFOs and other interplanetary beings as like a part of that co- context. Like, okay, this fits into my uh, my idea, my world. And then your your friend who went fishing, you know, he had to fit it into his world of his um, like Southern Baptist context. So fascinating. I do want to go back to what you said about my own belief and my own hope that aliens would bring us a less asshole version of earth. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, (laughs) So Stephen Greer, I am sure you're familiar with him, but he seems to have the same hope and he like holds these meditation circles where he echolocate is not the right word, but he basically like echolocates where he's at to just communicate to the other beings that were peaceful. And I would love for you to weigh in on his, viewpoints and his work really um sure so okay Stephen Greer I know about him I have not met him I do have friends that have um worked with him and I'm it's not my it's not my job to do this kind of thing right interact with something that um I'm not even if you know let's just put it this way it's not within the field of what I would do Um, So our paths haven't crossed. Um, 
Now, the question is, I'm just going to give you my personal opinion about whether or not aliens are going to help us be less jerky to each other. Like, you know, (laughs) this is actually something that I consider to be fundamental to why I was interested in studying religion, frankly, is that, and I just don't understand why people don't think about this, like, early in their lives, because I certainly did. Um, And I'm not saying, well, yes, I'm saying people dang well should, (laughs) is what I'm saying. Um, And it's this, it's that, you know, people are pretty cruel, and there's a lot of evil. And you just have to just open your eyes and you'll see it. And, you know, there's a lot of um, human trafficking more, you know, there are more, there's more slavery now than at any time in human history. A lot of those slaves are children. You know, this is all wrong. This is all bad. And we don't treat each other well. Corporations treat people terribly. Um, I saw all of this when I was a kid and I thought, do we really have to live this way? Is this really how we have to live? And I thought we could actually live well. I mean, you know, we could. We have the ability to do that. And so I thought, well, it looks like the nuns kind of have it figured out here. You know, the uh, the sisters that I, you know, they, they're they helping. They're making the world a better place. So I thought studying religion was probably the best route. I wasn't into, hey, I want to make as much money as I can and, you know, get as many toys before I die and that kind of thing, like a lot of people in my vicinity were doing, um, you know. So this this is the question. And I guess, and now that I'm a professor of religion and I was the chair of religion and philosophy for many years, and we would get um, people who, you know, they're called um, lifelong learners, so people in their 60s and above, who wanted to take courses in our department because they finally were asking these questions. And I thought, and these were very, these were professional people, right? They were, they had very successful jobs that they had retired from. And now they were asking these big kind of questions and they would come to my department and they'd say, we're really interested in this. And in my head, I would always think, if you had started to think about this when you were a kid, before you went to college, before you did your business, whatnot, we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in. That's what I was thinking. Like, you know, let's start thinking about this stuff early. So I guess that's a long way to say that I don't think aliens are going to help us out. I think we're going to have to do it. (laughs) And if we don't do it, that's on us. I can't think of a better note to conclude this conversation. That is an amazing thought. It really is because that, that makes it relevant because a question that I asked myself was, all right, what's, what's the point of all this other than entertainment? You know, it's, so, or, you know, mm-hmm. other than it makes great chats at the bar. <laughs> right, and right, and I, yeah. I think you just nailed it. Thank you so much. Um, as we, before we log off, will you tell people where to find your amazing book? Love this highly 10 out of 10 would recommend. Tell them Thanks. where you can, they can find this and, um, and social media. Okay. Thank you. Um, I do have a Twitter account at, D.W. Pasolka and an Amazon uh, author page. You can go there and you can see my books. Um, and I also have a faculty page. So uh, that's all I have time to do. I hope to get, you know, an Instagram account and things like that. But I just haven't had time to do that. But that's what I have now. That's perfect. Thank you again. This has been a really amazing conversation. Thanks, Meredith, for having me on your podcast. Hey, you're still here. That's awesome. I hope to see you next week too. I talk with the most interesting people that you've probably never heard of. Most of them are paradoxical and bring an opportunity for you to grow as a person. So if you like bright, meaningful entertainment, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications.